Recording. All right. Good morning, and welcome to Clarksville Association and the Government Affairs Committee. And thank you for taking the time to come and speak with us and let your your constituent know why you're running uh, to, for the representative. So, want you to take uh, about uh, two minutes to tell us about yourself, why you're running, and if you could tell us what areas your district covers. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you all for this opportunity to share my platform. My name is Monica Meeks. I am a soldier. I'm a wife, um, mother. I'm a part of two veteran service organizations here in Montgomery County. And I decided to run for office because I was tired of seeing more of the same. I'm someone that lobbied uh, since 2016 for veteran specific issues. And I was being blown off by the veteran caucus and that really got me frustrated. Number one reason I'm running is medical cannabis. I've been told by everybody, nobody cares about medical cannabis. <laughs> there are 39 states that have medical cannabis bills. And we have a bill that was so well written by a state senator in the state of Tennessee that Alabama used that bill and they now have medical cannabis and Tennessee doesn't. So I was very, very frustrated of doing everything I was told to do, be nice, dress professional, you know, go into the Veteran Caucus, and they still ignored me. So I decided to run for office. They want to actually put medical cannabis on the ballot box for 2023. It's just a way of kicking the can down the road. So that's something I'm very, very passionate about because I am a veteran and I care about things that happen to veterans. And having a medical cannabis bill will not only be beneficial to veterans, but people with chronic issues. So number one reason why I'm running. Uh, number two is to expand Medicaid. I, I'm always asked, why do you care so much about Medicaid? It affects me personally with something that happened with my mother. But we like to punish people in this state because they happen to be poor. If you look at the state budget, it's $42 billion. And we have $2 million set aside for underinsured and $8 million for tourism initiatives. And that's a huge problem for me that we like to continue to punish people because they happen to be poor. And the third reason I'm running is because I believe in the rights of parents, whether you agree with me or not. If you look at the state legislative bills, there have not been any bills that address the rights of parents in public school system. You have rights of parents as far as custody agreements, but you don't have anything that addresses the rights of parents with the curriculum that's being taught in these schools. I'm very, very active in schools, and I think that we can do a better job of getting our parents involved in what's going on in school system. So those are the three reasons I'm running. Okay, could you expand on the um, the area that, that uh, District 68 covers? Yes, yeah, 68 is most of um, East Montgomery, so they have done a little gerrymandering. I'll just be brutally honest with that. So Madison Street, Trenton Road, Tyler Town, um, O'Connor's, all that is District 68. Cracker Barrel, have some people on there that cover um, District 68. Sango area, all that follow, falls under District 68. Okay, thank you. All right, let's start off with that. Okay, gentlemen. Um, so with Tennessee effectively making homelessness a felony, how do you plan to address that? I want to overturn that bill, as I mentioned earlier. We like to punish people for being poor in this state. And if you look at the homeless population, you have a lot of my brothers and sisters that are veterans that are homeless. Sometimes it's mental issues. Sometimes it's substance abuse issues. I had an uncle that old overdosed. And a lot of his issues was homelessness and substance abuse, and I don't think that it's fair that we punish somebody that's struggling, and sometimes mental health. So all those three things, you know, we can do better. We need to overturn that bill. We were the first state, which is embarrassing, to punish someone for being homeless, and you're taking away their voting rights and all those different things. So that's very frustrating to me. Thank you. Um, oh, let's see. Um, let's talk about roads for a minute. Um, several things have come up uh, about roads. Uh, what can you do, what can we do at the state level to help improve our road system here in Montgomery County? Um, getting roads finished, getting roads uh, completed, uh, putting in new roads, expanding the interstate, what, what, what do you think? There is a lot we can do, and I actually in April thought I was being trolled by someone. She reached out to me, 
And I don't know if you've heard of Gary the Guardrail. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is, I didn't even know it was a famous landmark in Clarksville. So that's the, if you go on my page, that's the first place I went to and went live on when I decided I was going to run for office because they said Monica's a state road. So I did my own research. I happened to be a regulator and I found out that it is a state road. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I filed a maintenance request form on April 24th. 2022 with TDOT and ask me have I heard back from TDOT yet? No, I have not. So we need to streamline that process. We just need to make sure that if your recommendation is for me to reach out to TDOT for a state road, that someone at least gives me the attention that I'm asking for or say, hey, that's not my department, maybe refer me to somebody else. But none of my um, emails were responded to. I've been ignored since April 24th of this year, and that's unacceptable. We can do a lot better by people that are genuinely concerned about Gary the guardrail. My cousin in Maine, he's like, oh, I heard about it. You heard about it all the way in Maine. So there's also a committee, a transportation committee. Look and see who's on that committee. We need to follow the money and get these roads taken care of because it goes back and forth of who has jurisdiction. Is it a state road? Does it belong to the city? It is a state road, and it's making national attention for all the wrong reasons. Okay. Um, in a growing community like ours, there's a struggle to balance staying ahead of the growth and cost of expansion, expanding the infrastructure. What's your philosophy on growth and effectively supporting it? Well, we need to have smart growth, which we don't have now. There are apartment complexes being put up very quickly all over the place. There are a lot of houses that are very, very close to each other. So again, follow the money. But while all these things are being approved so quickly, but there are a lot of things that we can do. And I think that it's very, very sad when there are a few families in Clarksville who are benefiting from the growth and it's not trickling down to regular everyday people in the city and in this county. Thank you. Okay. With our overburdened prison system, this clear our, our current justice system is lacking effective processes. What do you feel is an uh, actionable measure to reduce recidivism? Yeah. Recidivism. I hate that word. <laughs> and that, that word beat me up when I was in the master's program. I do have a master's degree in criminal justice. And my question is, I hate answering the question with a question, but why is it overburdened? And it's overburdened because of PPP, privately profit prisons that are in this state, state and that are taking over. There are people who are being arrested, I mentioned my uncle earlier, for harmless, I'm not talking about hardened criminals, I'm talking about harmless marijuana possessions. Why are we arresting people for that? Every time Channel 5 News reports that we've busted somebody for marijuana, go to the comments sections and you'll see that that is a waste of time. So we need to stop overburdening the population of prisons and stop arresting people for simple marijuana possession. That will help with the overburden. And also there is a congressperson, she is in, out of Florida. I think her name is Congressman uh, Frederica Wilson. She's the one with the cowgirl hats. And she has a pilot program. Why don't we have anything like that in the state of Tennessee where you give people other options? When people are desperate, they turn to crime. I don't think we are inherently bad people. They're just people who just feel like this is the only option I have. So we need to do better, have a, pay, a pilot program, also more educational opportunities. But if we make up 5%, less than 5% of the world population, yet 25% of our citizens are incarcerated, that is not, that math does not math. So we need to just do better with that. Good. To follow up on that, um, so, you know, people with a criminal uh, record, it prevents them from renting and, and um, getting housing. And so how would you propose that we assist these people, like, like I said, not, not charging them, not putting them in jail for, for marijuana, but, but some, some of that, that's a stigma. Mm -hmm. So what do you propose we can do to assist uh, these people um, finding places to... Well, I found that it actually ties into the issues with transportation here in Clarksville. So I talked to some of my veteran sisters that help those who are on the sexual offender list and they cannot live. Of course, there's restrictions as to where mm -hmm. they can live. So we really need to improve, destigmatize, first of all, people that happen to need uh, affordable housing. And then we need to do better about our transportation so they have the ability to work. She said it took her forever to try to find 
housing for him because of he was a sexual offender. He's a, he was a veteran and he was restricted and then he did not drive. So his transportation was limited. So the requirement is, well, you have to work, but then you don't have access to uh, transportation if you um, rely on public transportation. So a lot of things that we need to do better about our citizens. And I even actually have a, um, a veteran sister that relies solely on public transportation. So on Sundays, unless she gets a ride, she can't go anywhere. She's an older woman, so we can just do better by just destigmatizing a lot of the narrative, false narratives that we have floating around. Okay. Going along with that, what are some of the, besides you, you talked real heavily about marijuana and legalizing marijuana, what other, uh, for lack of a better word, minority crimes would you say needs to be uh, re redone as far as maybe taking off the books or you know have something else to be done because you know the judges follow the state law so it's going to have to come from the state legislature what what the punishments are going to be mm -hmm. so what crimes would you look at as far as removing or changing how they're punished well i would look at the plea bargain system a lot of people plea bargain because they don't have access to uh, quality legal assistance and i wouldn't say marijuana is not a minority crime Contrary to popular belief, we're just six times more likely to be stopped for it, but a lot of people use marijuana in the state. Well, I'm not talking about that as far as that. I, I look at marijuana as low down priority as far as the ranking of criminal activity. Right. All right. So I'm just asking what besides marijuana, what else would you see? Just looking at the plea bargain system and, and people that feel so desperate to get out that they'll do a plea bargain when they actually sometimes you have people that are innocent. And they're, you know, agreeing to a plea bargain just so they can mm -hmm. return to their family. So there's a lot of things within the criminal justice system that we need to look at. But number one for me will always be a marijuana medical. I mean, just stop charging people with minor or simple possession of marijuana. That will stop a lot of the backlog. Mm -hmm. And can I add also, um, I was a mentee for Veterans Treatment Court. So we could have more programs because only 1% of the population are veterans. So the treatment that... Um, Judge Goble and those veteran mentees provide with someone that stopped at those that have frequent, if you have a TBI or a documented PTS, then you have the opportunity to have everything that you've done as far as certain things expunged like you've never done. It's a rigorous one year program, but we also can create programs that where if it's simple possession or other things, plea bargaining that we can help them. If they if you complete this program, whatever it is, then it, give, it wipes your state clean. So. So, I'm going to ask a question. Probably, is there a cost associated with that? Well, with Veterans Treatment Corps, most of those are volunteers. I have a lot of friends that do it, and you have a lot of retirees with that. They only meet—I shouldn't say only one, because I don't want to be uh, managing their time—but they meet every Tuesday. And a lot of the people that help with that are former veterans, maybe some people who found themselves on the wrong side of the law. So they're not being, there's very few paid positions with Veterans Treatment Court in Montgomery County because of the awesome volunteers. Right. So just get volunteers to do it. So is that something that you could, at, at the state level, maybe um, broaden to include the public? Absolutely. Programs like that to help the public? So. Absolutely. I found out about when I was able to do it for two years because of my schedule. I can't do it any longer. But I found out about it through an Army retiree magazine. So a lot of people want to help. They just don't know, you know, where to roll their sleeves up. And, yeah, the information's not all right. Right, absolutely. What, um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to go ahead and ask the next question. What's your position on alternative transportation, like light rail? We need it desperately. We have family in Atlanta. I would love to be able, and not that I don't, I don't mind driving, and I have access to, you know, a privately owned vehicle. But we desperately need it. I used public transportation for three years when I was working downtown Nashville, and I was very, very fortunate because we had a, no stops. It would um, pick you up at exit eleven and take us directly downtown Nashville. And that there was like fifth, I forgot how many seats. I think thirty-two, thirty-three people. That that's you know, alleviating 32 different vehicles going to Nashville because we know that the higher paying jobs are in Nashville. So I'm someone that benefited from using public transportation for three years. So we definitely need uh, to do better. We, I would love to be able to get on the train and go all the way to Chattanooga instead of driving. So I 110% support um, public transportation. Thank you.
Um, I was going to ask about, um, uh, you talked about uh, parental rights, basically when it comes to schools. What are you what are you talking about as far as that's concerned? I'm specifically talking about the curriculum. I looked at my son's history book, I think when he was a junior last year, and um, the, the history of African Americans did not start with slavery. So there are a lot of components that are missing. So we know the Department of Education controls the curriculum despite all these bills. We like to flan, um, you know, throw gasoline on the fire with culture wars, but I would like better representation with the curriculum um, in the school system. I would like parents in, across the board to have more involvement with what our children are being teaching, being taught. Uh, in the uh, Montgomery County school system. And that's something from the state representative level that we can regulate better. We need study sessions. There are a lot of things that we can do better that we're not, we're not doing. So specifically the curriculum I have an issue with. What are your thoughts on um, these uh, other schools that are uh, privately? Um... Religious charter schools? Mm -hmm. That's, charter schools. that's yeah. what I call them. They're religious charter schools. You're trying to defund public school systems and you're trying to be malicious about it. There are people who are advocating for it and they don't realize that they are chess pieces and they are big players. They only put a pin in it. People are saying we won. I spoke at the school board against charter schools, but people are saying that we won. I'm like, you did not win. They're kicking the can down the road to January to see who's going to be elected for governors. But we have not heard the last of Hilldale um, College. We have not. They will be back again in January guaranteed. What about the other private schools? Well, if, as far as the vouchers for travel um, for private schools, mm -hmm. like well, if you look at the tuition for Clarksville Academy, I think it's seven thousand. Don't quote me on that. But the voucher doesn't even cover uh, the private school here. So if you can afford a thousand dollars for most parents cannot with the average salary being sixty five thousand for Montgomery County. So we don't just have a thousand dollars laying around. So. If you can afford to send your kids to private school, then send them to private schools, but you do not get to take school funds that are for public schools to send your kids to private school. That's not fair. Even though I know a lot of kids get scholarships um, to Clarksville Academy, I don't think we should use public funds for private schools. I think we should fund fully. We have so many shortages within CMCSS right now, and you want to start a charter school and you no, that's that's not right. That's not fair to our teachers and the workers at CMCSS. Thank you. Anything? Can't finish this this quickly. Okay. Yeah, I have, I have some more <laughs> questions for you here. Mm -hmm. I've got one okay. really quick, Mercy. It's not on the list here, but you talked about education in Montgomery County schools. Uh, you know, and several years ago, the state had threatened to take over Davidson County because of the graduation rate. That was one of the reasons. How how do you feel about something like that happening? Well, I do not want the state to take over uh, the school boards here. We have we have a school board that they're an elected body, so we should trust them. The voters put them in office, but we also need, a, again, going back to that pilot program, we do have uh, academies. I think West Creek has a criminal justice uh, program, so we need to afford just more opportunities. We do have some great ones here, but we need to continue to um, provide more opportunities for the students here at CMCSS. Okay. What sets you apart from the other candidates? Are, are you unopposed or are you, you, no, you're running? Oh, you know, I'm running against the 18-year incumbent, which is fine. So mm -hmm. a lot of things. And I won't just, you know, limit it to my uh, opponent. I will say all three districts, uh, 68 and 75 as well. First of all, I'm the only woman running. Second of all, I'm the only independent. And it's really challenging when you run as an independent because you don't have the, I have zero endorsements. I am not backed by political action committees. I'm also the most educated. I have a master's degree. You know, I'm also certified police officer graduated, you know, Tennessee Law Enforcement Training Academy, uh, class 1643, former IG, certified fraud examiner, which is that's an exam that really kicked my behind. So I'm the most educated um, of all, not just 68, all of us that are running. So all of the above, 
I'm for here for the people. I'm not here for political action committees. I don't need any endorsements. I've been offered some and I have respectfully declined. Saying, oh, no, thank you on that one. So that's what set me, sets me apart is I'm not a part of any establishment. I'm running in a way that's never been done before in Montgomery County. So that's what sets me apart, all the above. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Well, you know, we, we appreciate you taking the time to come here and um, tell us a little about yourself and, and, uh, and uh, to your constituents that um, why you want to be their representative. So, you know, in, in closing, you can summarize and say, um, you know, go again, emphasize to the people why you want them to elect you as your their representative. I want to be elected as your representative because the same old, same old status quo, I am an objector of it and there's a better way of doing things. We have not had a town hall in the last 15 years that I've been here with an incumbent who's been in that seat for 18 years. He is very selective in who he talks to. I am for everyday people, whether you agree with me or not, one of the first persons to sign my petition was a red hatter, a very extreme conservative. And once I mentioned my platform, medical cannabis, he says, you should have started with that. I don't care about any of that other stuff. So I am someone that is not doing it the way it's ever been done before, but I think I am the woman for the job. I am the most qualified and I appreciate anybody that will give me their support and their vote. All right, thank you and good luck. Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs>